Hey there, my name is Daniel Cape, and I'm the owner of Experience to Creativity. And I'm a, a creativity educator, creativity trainer. And I was scheduled to give this, this presentation at the North Carolina Association for Institutional Research Conference in Pembroke on March 17th. But in lieu of everything that's going on, things are being canceled. And I still wanted to present this information to the attendees of that conference, the people that, that would benefit from learning about creativity. So this presentation, as I mentioned, is basically is it was designed for the people at the conference, but it also benefits business leaders and educators or just anyone wanting to be more creative in general. All of the topics and the concepts that I'm going to discuss now apply to our lives, our everyday lives, our work lives, basically anything that we do. I'm going to talk about three concepts related to creativity. I'm going to talk about everyday creativity and how it is that everyone is creative. Then we're going to look at challenging assumptions and we're going to question everything. We're going to finish with appreciative inquiry and how it is that looking at our strengths or building on our strengths is actually a, it's a creative way of improving our organizations and our lives. Conference was supposed to be at Pembroke Golf Course, so I had to include something golf related. So I'm going to start out with a really stupid golf joke. Why did the golfer wear two shirts? Because she got a hole in one. Okay. A lot of people say, I'm not creative. I don't have a creative bone in my body. But what they may not realize is that humor is part of creativity. And everyone has a funny bone and a humorous bone. So at the very least, they have two creative bones in their bodies. All right, this concludes the comedy portion of my speech. We're gonna move on and put that behind us and talk about some real stuff here. I've always been a fairly creative person, but it wasn't until a few years ago when I started working on my PhD in psychology with a focus in creativity studies, that I realized the significance of creativity in our lives. And I realized that creativity is a teachable skill. The best way to become more creative is to learn about creativity. I also began to appreciate some aspects about my parents and the way they raised me that I wasn't aware of before I started to understand creativity. My mom was always supportive of my ridiculous and absurd ideas. And I'll give you an example. When I was a kid, I used to like to take apart my remote control cars and my toys, and I would see what they were made of. And then I would take the pieces or the parts from those toys, and I would try to put them together in my own way to create something new. One night, I was messing around with a light bulb on those motors from my remote control cars some wires and a battery, and I connected them all together. And to my surprise, the light bulb and the motor came on at the same time. And I had one of those metaphorical light bulb moments when I realized the geniusness of what I'd created. So I gathered them and I ran to my mom's room and I connected them all together, the, the light bulb and the motor and the wires and the battery. And I said, look, mom, it's a flashlight for blind people because the motor comes on at the same time as the light bulb so they know they can feel that it's working. Well, my mom laughed at me and then I laughed too because I realized how ridiculous it was what I had invented. But what my mom didn't do was provide any negative criticism or harsh feedback about my silly idea. She didn't say, you'll never be creative or you need to forget this hobby and Go do something useful and productive. Instead, she supported me. And this is important because a lot of times we come up with ideas or other people come up with ideas that may seem ridiculous or useless at the time. However, if we allow those ideas to develop instead of dismissing them automatically, they might turn into something useful and productive later on. Now, 
I didn't go on to develop a flashlight for blind people, but somebody else did. And this is what it looks like. They have an earpiece and then they have a device that they can point in a certain direction. And the device helps them locate an object like their keys, or it helps them or find a person in a crowd. And the device tells them how far away that object is so that they can find it. Who knew a flashlight for blind people would be a thing someday? My dad was always providing us with these amazing experiences when I was a kid. He would take us caving or camping, and we got to travel all over the country when I was younger. And because of that, experiences have become part of who I am, and they're important for how I learn and engage with the world. And because of that, I want to provide you all with an experience right now. And you can see me down on the bottom right corner. If you haven't noticed me yet, I'm going to show you what to do. And I'm going to talk you through this. The first thing you need to do, you're going to use your hands. So the first thing you need to do is stick your arms straight out just like this, like you're dancing with the love of your life in seventh grade. Next, you're going to flip your hands outward like that. Okay. Then you're going to take one hand, either one, it doesn't matter, and you're going to cross it over the other hand. And you're going to interlock your fingers. Then you're going to take your index finger and your thumb like this. So you're going to take these two fingers and you're going to stick them straight out like this. Finally, what you're going to do is you're going to turn your hands over like this and just flip them rotate them like that. You can do it quickly, you can do it slowly. Okay, are you able to do that? Did you have any problems? You, pro you probably did. If you're like me the first time I saw it, you're like, what the heck just happened? Let me explain what I did and why I did it. What I did was I just created something called cognitive dissonance. And that's when your mind is presented with competing perceptions or competing assumptions. So you all may have had the assumption that my hands were crossed like yours, which makes it impossible to rotate. But what you may or may not have noticed is that when I showed you my hands like this, I crossed my hands differently. So I was able to do that. So the reason I created cognitive dissonance is because we live our lives so much based on routines and assumptions that we often question the world around us. We often question the information that we're receiving. And when we're presented with cognitive dissonance, it actually primes our minds and it opens us up to new ideas and new concepts. And this is important because today we're gonna to be talking about creativity. And so many people have misconceptions or false assumptions about creativity. That it's important that we open our minds up and we're able to receive new information. All right, here's a great sentence or a great quote on creative thinking and why it's so important to understand creativity. It comes from Dr. Sandy Burnett, who's at the International Center for Studies in Creativity. Dr. Burnett says that creative thinking is more than coming up with new ideas. It's about living a life in a way that is open, authentic, and curious. It's a mindset and approach to everything we do. This is so important to understand because a lot of people think that creativity is something we use during certain times, or they think creativity is some exclusive skill that only a few people have and other people don't. But the fact is that when we begin to see what creativity is and understand it, we begin to see it in our everyday lives. And creativity really is a mindset and approach to everything we do. And the more we understand that, the more we begin to see creativity in our work, in our lives, in our relationships, and everywhere. I want to begin by starting by talking about everyday creativity and how it is that everyone is creative. Everyday creativity are the acts that we do on a daily basis that help us overcome those small barriers or roadblocks. It's kind of like 
finding your way around an unexpected detour on the way to work. We have to find a solution to these problems or we can't go on with our lives. And this is creativity. The problem is that people don't recognize it as being creative. And so they don't acknowledge it and they don't celebrate it, but they should. Here's a simple model that explains everyday creativity. As I mentioned, you're going through your daily routine and then you run into an unexpected problem. This could be anything from a shoelace breaking on your way to work, or you find out that you're missing an ingredient in a recipe. So you have to come up with a solution. Maybe you substitute an ingredient in that recipe. Maybe you go find a, I don't know, duct tape or another shoelace or something like that. And then you go on with your daily routine. And it's that simple. Let me give you a story about everyday creativity. And this story is pretty extreme. It actually changed our lives and our bodies. But it's a great story. In 1938, a lady named Ruth Wakefield was running an inn in Massachusetts. And one day she was baking chocolate cookies. And she realized that she was out of baker's chocolate. So what she did was she substituted that ingredient for semi-sweet chocolate. And she broke it up into small pieces and put it into the dough because she thought that it would melt and turn into chocolate cookies. To her surprise, when she pulled the cookies out of the oven, the semi-sweet chocolate didn't melt, but instead created one of America's favorite cookies, chocolate chip cookies, which were subsequently named Toll House cookies after the Toll House Inn where Ruth Wakefield worked. Now, as I mentioned, this is a pretty extreme example of everyday creativity. Most of the time we just do it and then we go on with our lives and it doesn't have such a, an impact on our lives as chocolate chip cookies. But still, it's that simple. She just ran into a problem, substituted the ingredient and bam, problem solved. It's not just enough to learn about creativity or to hear that you are creative. It's crucial that we begin to look for creativity and everyday creativity in our lives. My assignment for you is to start looking for everyday creativity in your life today or for the rest of the week or even for the rest of your lives. Start to identify everyday creativity in yourself or others. In fact, I want you to start looking at creativity differently. Imagine if someone says, I'm stupid. I have no intelligence at all. Would you accept that? No, we don't accept that because it's not true. However, we often accept it when someone says, I'm not creative. I don't have a creative bone in my body. This is BS and it needs to stop. Everyone is creative. We just need to start recognizing it. So maybe an example of everyday creativity that you might see is perhaps you'll have to adjust your routine because of this coronavirus. Or maybe you'll have to discover a parenting technique because of a new problem with your child. This is creative. Everyone is creative. You just need to recognize it, acknowledge it, and celebrate it. Let's move on. Next, we're gonna talk about challenging assumptions. So important for creativity and for life. As I mentioned at the beginning, so many people, or we, we often, everyone does it, we go through life based on routines and assumptions. And this isn't a bad thing because having assumptions and going through our lives with the routines allows our minds or it frees our minds to receive other information. Otherwise, we'd be so overwhelmed that we probably couldn't go through our daily tasks. But still, assumptions stop us from trying new methods or ideas and progressing ourselves, our businesses, and society. Here's my metaphor for challenging assumptions. It's kind of like getting into a lazy river. At some point you get in there, you got your, your float thing, your tube, and you just get in there and you're going the same direction as everybody else. You don't have to do anything. And if something happens, it's pretty safe. These rivers are only, only like two and a half or three feet deep. That's what it's like to challenge or to live by assumptions. It's safe, you don't have to think about it and everybody's doing the same thing. 
we get assumptions from our culture or past experiences. And these, terms, these turn into routines and assumptions, and they're unquestioned processes. The thing is that we have to challenge these assumptions. We have to challenge assumptions, processes, or even experiences that we have. In fact, Thomas Edison, whenever he would interview a new applicant, he would invite that person over to his house for a bowl of soup. And if that person salted their soup before they tasted it, Thomas Edison would not hire them because he wanted someone who didn't have assumptions built into their lives so much. And he wanted people that could approach problems from a new perspective. Let me give you an example of how challenging assumptions change an industry and even a country. I'm sure we're all familiar with the story of Henry Ford. Henry Ford created the assembly line, which made car manufacturing so much more efficient and cheaper and faster. Before the assembly line, workers would move around the car. It would take longer. So Henry Ford challenged that assumption and he brought the car to the workers. The way it worked is the assembly line would bring the cars to the workers and the workers would do the same routine over and over. And then it would keep on going to the next person. And one of his philosophies was that if there was a problem or if they saw an issue, you don't stop the assembly line. Because if you stopped it, it's gonna slow production and that's gonna cost people money and time. And it was successful. Now, let's fast forward to after World War II, when Japan was trying to recover their economy and their infrastructure. A few companies like Toyota and Sony adopted a new philosophy and they challenged Ford's assumption that had been successful for decades. Their philosophy was that they installed these pull cords at every worker station. And if anyone from the CEO to the lowest guy on the factory, if anyone saw a problem, they could stop the assembly line by pulling this cord. So instead of just letting the problem go by, they were able to identify more problems and they were able to discover uh, more solutions that made their products higher quality. But this also did something else. It empowered their employees to have ownership over their jobs. And this is creative. This is creativity at work. When we have power to identify problems in our jobs, we have higher job satisfaction. And as we know, Japanese products like cars and electronics have, have been the leader, or they've been the leader in manufacturing these for decades, all because they challenge an assumption and they challenged an assumption that was very successful. Here's your assignment for challenging assumptions. I invite you to challenge your routines, your beliefs, or other assumptions, especially if this is the way, this is like the red light term. If this, that's the way things have always been done. Anytime you hear that, you need to question your assumptions. You need to question your routines. I challenge you to question the assumptions of people who are experts in the field, or if you've been in the field for a long time. You might fail, you might make mistakes. And if you do, that's great, good job. That's part of the creative process. As organizations, we need to empower people through trust and safety, and that's mutual trust. It goes both ways. To try new things, to challenge assumptions, and to fail and make mistakes. Because although we may fail at the beginning, it may turn into something more successful that changes our beliefs or our processes or our methods, maybe even our industries. I got a bonus tip for you. Anytime that you're trying to solve a problem with an unknown solution, use the word might. What I mean is, instead of using the words like, how can we solve this? How are we going to solve this? How will we solve this? Or how should we do this? Use the word might. When we use words like can, are, will, should, those words imply commitment. And they make us feel like we have to come up with only the right answer. But if we use the word might, it opens our minds up to other possibilities. How might we do this? It says we can come up with ridiculous ideas like I talked about at the beginning. 
and it opens up the creative flow. I want to finish by talking about appreciative inquiry. This is something that you can use to help improve or strengthen your organization or even your daily lives or some of the processes or research that you're doing. Appreciative inquiry is a strengths-based positive approach to leadership development and organizational change. What this means is that if we're wanting to solve a problem, such as employee retention or student retention, instead of saying, how can we fix these? We gotta fix all the problems, all the things wrong, and we're gonna look at what's wrong and we're gonna investigate that and we're gonna fix that part. Instead, appreciative inquiry says, this is the problem we wanna focus on, but we're gonna look at our strengths instead. We're gonna focus on what's working and then we're gonna build on that. And this is creative for several reasons. For one, it goes against tradition. Number or two, it's gonna use stories. And I'm not sure if you picked up on my love for stories, but stories are great for creativity because they inspire us. They talk about universal human experiences and they give us purpose and meaning in our lives, whether we know it or not. Let me give you an, a, a model and briefly explain appreciative inquiry and how it works and how it is creative. We're gonna start out with number one. So we're gonna choose the positive as the focus of the inquiry. And this has to be a conscious decision as opposed to only focusing on the negative aspects. Then we're gonna start looking at exceptionally positive moments. And this is gonna give us more energy. It's gonna energize our process. It's gonna inspire us to keep going as opposed to only focusing on the negatives. This is also important for creativity because internal motivation is positive. It helps creativity. We're gonna be more internally motivated if we focus on the positives. Then we're gonna to start to share stories and identify some of the, the life-giving forces of our experiences that are gonna support our goals for whatever it is that we're trying to solve. Next, we're going to use those stories and we're going to start to create an image. We're going to dream about ways that we might solve this problem. This is divergent thinking. This is imagination and this is creativity. Again, because we're using positive stories, we're going to be more energized and we're going to be more motivated and invested in solving this problem in a positive way. And finally, we're going to come up with some innovative ways and we're going to improvise ways that we can use this to implement it to improve our, our future, our organization, our lives, or whatever it is we're trying to solve. Again, this is different from focusing on a problem and only focusing on the negative aspects that we want to improve. We're going to build on the positives. And guess what? I've got a story. In the 19, I think it was the 1980s and the 1990s, some villages in rural Vietnam were experiencing malnutrition. So they called a guy, or they called a, a nonprofit named Save the Children. And Save the Children sent in a man named Jerry Sternen to help solve the problem. When Jerry arrived in Vietnam, he was greeted by a high-ranking government official who informed Jerry that not everyone was happy about his presence there. And they said that he only had six months to solve the problem. Six months isn't enough time to do their typical, typical processes or methods where they do in-depth investigations. And then they set up maybe educational centers around the area, the affected areas. Six months is not enough time. So what Jerry did is he got to work right away. The first thing he did was he began to interview families from these villages that were affected. And this is what he found out. These families ate two times a day. And if a child, and they did not support the children eating, like we might imagine where you maybe cut the food for the children or you make sure they eat all the vegetables or whatever that is. Also, if a kid was sick, a kid did not eat. Ugh, couldn't imagine. And also these families did not eat crustaceans. So things like crab and shrimp. And the reason they didn't eat these is because they were considered lower class foods. So after Jerry found this information, he wondered if there were examples of families that were actually healthy 
or thriving or not experiencing malnourishment. And he found some. And as it turns out, these families were lower income families. These families ate the same amount of food, but they ate three times a day. And they supported the children in eating. And if a kid was sick, the kid still ate. But these families ate crab and shrimp and sweet potato greens, things that were considered lower class foods. These foods also have important vitamins and minerals in them that help the families and the children to be healthier. So Jerry's next step was he took the mothers from these healthier families that were lower class and he had them educate the mothers or the families from these other malnourished families. And as a result, Jerry was able to solve the problem in six months. And he did this using appreciative inquiry or as a method of appreciative inquiry. All right, so my challenge for you is to notice what's working well, either in your life or in your organization at work. Think about ways that you can build on these strengths. Maybe talk to your employees and ask them for positive stories. How can you use these to improve your organization? How can you use these positive stories to, in, to help your family or even yourself? Focus on the positive and build on what's working. And I invite you to look more into appreciative inquiry. To recap on what we talked about today, it's important to understand that everyone is creative. You shouldn't just hear that and believe it. You need to look for it and you need to understand it. We need to start recognizing it, acknowledging it, and celebrating it in our lives, in our work, everywhere. And we talked about challenging assumptions and how challenging assumptions can help us break routines. They can help us discover more effective methods. And then finally, we talked about appreciative inquiry and how it's important to focus on our strengths to improve organizations. This could be with student retention, student grades, or something in your life, maybe parenting examples in your life. Look at what's working and build on your strengths. If you're interested in finding out more about what I do, I invite you to visit my website, experiencetocreativity.com. Just so you know, I live in Boone, North Carolina, and I'm happy to travel to do workshops or speeches or present at conferences. And if you want some great tools and resources to help you or your organization implement and understand creativity, I've got two things I offer. I've got my Epic cards. They come in a deck of 50, each card has a different prompt or question or activity that helps teach and promote creativity. And then I've also got my book, From Experience to Creativity. I tried to make this, it's super accessible, it's easy to understand, and it's easy to apply to your life. So those are my two products. Here's my website. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions or comments or concerns about my bow tie. Before I go, I just wanna throw out one final thought. I've been drawing caricatures for over 15 years. And one thing I hear a lot of people say is, I wish I could draw, I can only draw stick figures. I tell those people that there's someone out there who only draws stick figures. And they draw them of people's families. And then those families put them on the backs of the cars. I bet the person only drawing stick figures is doing just fine. The point of my story isn't about art or artistic ability. The point is that so many of us have false or misleading assumptions about what is and is not creative or about what we can and cannot do, that we limit our potential. Again, everyone is creative, but not everyone knows it. And the best way to become more creative is to learn about creativity. So thank you again to the North Carolina Association of Institutional Research for considering me for your lunchtime speaker. I'm sorry that we weren't able to, to meet face to face. And I hope this video helps you out in some way. If you're not with the, the NCAIR, I hope this video still helps you out in your business or your life or your teaching practice. So thank you again. Please feel free to contact me with any questions you have. 
I geek out over this stuff, people. I love talking about creativity. So thank you very much and have a great week.